Welcome everyone again. My name is Carmen Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to a special webinar for the advisors who've been part of the APSIA Network and APSIA Workshops. Today we're going to be talking about the Public Policy and International Affairs Fellowship Program. I'm joined by Simone Bolo, the PPIA Executive Director, and she's going to share more of the details with you about the tremendous work that they do to reach students, particularly those who are often underrepresented in public service. I also wanted to let you know that this is one of what we hope is an ongoing series of webinars looking at different opportunities and programs for students. So I look forward to staying in touch with you and sharing more invitations to webinars like these. As we go through the presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in that chat box on the right hand side of your screen. We'll take all of them at the end once Simone has been able to share her information with us. Her slides will also be available afterwards. If you would like to email me, I can easily share them with you as well as Simone's contact information. Surprise, Simone, I'm going to share it with them. Yeah. And a recording will be available on the APSIA YouTube page shortly after the webinar concludes. So with that, I am delighted to turn the floor over to Simone to talk a little bit about the, the fellowship. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Simone Bolo, and I'm the executive director for the Public Policy and International Affairs Program, and delighted to spend some time with you all this afternoon to talk a little bit about what we do um, and answer any questions that you may have about our program. So PPIA, uh, we have, well, we're approaching our 40th year um, in the business of training uh, the next generation of diverse leaders that are going into public service. And our mission is really around promoting um, inclusion and full participation of underrepresented groups in public service so that they're able to reach the highest level of leadership roles um, within public service. And we believe that representation matters and that uh, these young people that we are training should look like and represent what our what our current uh, demographics look like, um, not just domestically, but also uh, globally as well. So we strive to make sure that we are um, reaching those from very diverse, broadly diverse backgrounds in our program. Um, the goal of our program is really to train and prepare uh, diverse students to go into advanced degree programs um, in either public policy, public administration, international affairs, or related field. And we do that primarily through our junior summer institutes. Um, our junior summer institutes are a seven week rigorous preparation for graduate school program. And I can't put enough emphasis on that. It is an academic rigorous preparation program. So students that apply and if they are admitted will be spending their summers in, in classes um, and doing a variety of things over those summer, seven weeks. Um, another reason I put emphasis on that is because oftentimes students will apply to us and not really clear that this is an academic program. We do a little bit around professional development, not um, our, our focus, but really it's the preparation piece. And I'll dive into what that preparation looks like um, as we go through the slides here. We also have a number of partnerships uh, with universities all across the country. And we call that partnership our Graduate School Consortium. Right now we sit at about 56 members. Um, essentially they are schools of public policy and international affairs that are interested and concerned with recruiting and making sure that they're recruiting the most diverse class that they can bring into their, their schools um, to train and then go out into the world and, and, and work in the public sector. Um, we also have a large alumni network. So being around 40 plus years in different iterations, we have alumni base that's more than 4,000 um, of folks who are at all points of the continuum within their careers from folks that are just out of the program to folks that are in senior level positions in government, um, both the state, uh, local, state, and federal levels. Um, our junior summer institutes, as I was mentioning before, is that seven weeks rigorous preparation for grad school program. Essentially, it's a boot camp. 
So um, during that time, those, those seven weeks, students are uh, in courses and they're learning about what they need to know to be successful in graduate school, particularly policy schools, and what type of roles they can potentially have that's going to influence um, serving the public good. Currently, we have five host sites uh, at the University of Michigan, the Ford School of Public Policy, at the University of California, Berkeley, the Goldman School of Public Policy, um, at Car Carnegie Mellon University, the Heinz College, uh, the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and then last, Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And so those are all five hosts. So your students, as you're advising them to apply, will be ranking those schools um, based on the schools that they're interested in um, and can kind of see themselves that potentially in the future. And so our program really, in terms of focusing on that preparation piece, is really about helping students, giving students the tools they'll need to succeed in graduate school. Um, and so if you have had any experience with any of our alum or have students that have participated in the past, what you'll find is that many of these students that when they go and transition into graduate school, they really, it eases that transition and they're really prepared in the sense of that first year, they know what to expect, they're able to navigate it um, and progress in their degree programs. So we kind of, we are giving students kind of a head start to what they're going to experience in graduate school. Um, in terms of our national network, I mentioned the five host schools that we have. We also do a large expo in DC every summer. Um, our, we call that the Public Service Expo. That generally attracts about 60 or so policy schools and about 30 or so um, internship programs, fellowship programs, um, those from uh, the think tank community that have opportunities for students. We do that every summer in DC in July. So it's something just to kind of keep an eye on in case you have students that will be in the DC area um, interning over the summer. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a number of graduate school consortium members. Um, and with our large network of alumni, we have alumni chapters also on a national level where students can, once they finish their program, they can connect back to the alumni network for other opportunities. So just a, a little bit more detail uh, in terms of the Junior Summer Institute, which is um, what we're gonna spend most of our time talking about, is that students are um, taking graduate level coursework over those seven weeks. They will be taking a statistics course. Um, they will be taking a policy analysis course. They'll have some um, exposure to econ and, and quali uh, quantitative um, analysis and qualitative analysis. So they're really working through um, at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the entry levels, at the base levels, at a graduate level, those types of coursework. Um, also during the summer, they're also doing a number of other things. So it's not just about the preparation, which is a large part of the program. They spend most of their time in courses, but we try to integrate um, other aspects that will inform them and educate them about careers um, in the public service sector. Uh, we will bring in our alumni who are doing things all over the country, um, to be guest lecturers. We'll have panel presentations um, from faculty that are at the institution about their work as practitioners and as academics. We also provide some support, um, and this looks different at every site, around the GRE um, test prep. And so we, we know that that's a, a important part of the preparation for graduate school. So we offer that in a, in a, in a variety at all of our programs in some form. Um, the students over the summer are also working on a topic that they're interested in. Um, and so they do some um, discussion in the early weeks about what those topics may be so that they are working on them over the summer um, to be able to present um, either on their research or present a capstone project at the end of the summer. All of the work that they do over the summer is evaluated um, by the faculty members at each of the institutions. Um, and, and so they would be given that evaluation from the schools that they're at based on where um, they're admitted for the Junior Summer Institutes. The program is free for our students, all students that are admitted and decide um, to accept that, that offer. Um, and then they also are supported with a, a stipend to provide that's provided to them upon completion of the program. In terms of just a, a few numbers, last summer we admitted 130 fellows, um, and then we 
have about an acceptance rate of about 20%. We see about 600 or so applications uh, come in annually. And students are coming from all over um, the country, as you can see. For last um, term, it went from 30 different states all over the, the country. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, the criteria that students should be aware of as they're thinking about this program as um, a potential summer experience for them is that we are looking nationally um, in terms of recruitment. Uh, at Princeton and Berkeley, they select 30 students each year. Um, at Berkeley, they have a law fellows track, which means these students are interested in public policy and law. And so they do a law module over the seven weeks. Um, and only 10 of, 10 of those 30 are selected for that. And again, when students apply, they're ranking. And so if they're interested in a law, a joint degree in law and public policy, they would make sure to rank that pretty high. That's something they're strongly considering. Um, Carnegie Mellon is, they typically pick about or select about 30 students. Um, they also have a unique track as well. They, in their second running this upcoming summer of the data analytics track. And so again, when students are ranking, if they're interested in big data um, or the analytics part, they would uh, select the Carnegie Mellon data analytics track as being one of the ones that they're very interested in, in terms of their ranking. Uh, the University of Minnesota and the University of Michigan select about 20 students every summer. In the application, we're looking for students who have demonstrated and are committed to public service, um, either through public policy or international affairs. And so as you're, as you're talking to your students and, and coaching them around their application for the public policy international affairs book program, they must be able to show that demonstrated, um, not just only in their coursework, but in the things they're doing outside of the classroom as well. So the Junior Summer Institute, we are looking for students um, who will graduate between December 2020 and August 21st. So they should be finishing up or going into their junior year when they're applying to us and then spending the summer of their after their junior year with us um, during the Junior Summer, summer Institute. We do admit DACA students um, and international students can apply as well. Uh, we have specifics on our websites in terms of like which uh, schools um, are looking for specifics around those, but in terms of all programs, um, do it except DACA students. And all majors are welcome. So we see students that span from every single major um, across um, the breadth that's available at institutions across the country, from engineering to pre-health to political science. We see a, a pretty, pretty, pretty diverse variety of majors that apply to our program. And what we're looking for is that they um, are showing that they have strong academic potential um, and that commitment that I mentioned earlier in terms of demonstrated. So what are they doing either on campus, um, in their communities, outside of campus, um, for even employment that are addressing issues affecting um, our diverse communities with it across the country um, within their respective community. We're looking for strong letters of recommendation um, I would often tell students that this is a professional document, so we're looking at things are are well are well written, um, and I have they've done what they need to do in order to get support around editing to make sure that it, it's a it's a strong um, professional application that they submit. We're looking for um, resumes that uh, demonstrate all of their experiences. And I would say for our resumes that we're looking for, um, we often tell students to put everything in it. So from employment to volunteerism, to things they're doing on campus or have done before they even got to campus, we want to kind of see everything that they've been engaged with, especially um, if it is around um, showing and demonstrating that commitment to public service or international affairs. And then we also um, are looking at it, what their need is in terms of um, economic need. We, that is part of our consideration. So our our application requirements, we do ask for two letters of recommendation of recommendation for, from students, um, and we recommend that one of those letters is an academic letter, so coming from an advisor, a faculty member, um, someone within their institution, and then we're looking for a letter that that demonstrates um, their service. So wherever they're doing that work outside of the classroom, someone that can speak to that experience and their experiences with them. Um, every applicant is required to complete three um, essays, and so those essays focus on what their goals are, their background, um, what are their motivations for pursuing public service, and why graduate school, 
what they hope to gain from the Junior Summer Institutes and their experiences with diverse communities. Uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Carnegie Mellon, they require an additional essay and their essay will focus on those tracks that they offer. So for UC Berkeley, it will be why law and public policy. And then for um, Carnegie Mellon, it will be why they are interested in um, policy and data analytics. Um, students will upload a resume. They'll upload all of their transcripts for all colleges that they attended. And then um, their uh, financial aid information um, from their school and uh, we asked for, or either their parents' tax information um, from their FAFSA. So in terms of the selection process, each whole school, so the five, has, has their own unique selection process. Um, these folks have been have been um, hosting this program for a number of years, probably with the exception of Humphrey. Humphrey, this is their this will be their fourth cohort um, of the, as the most recent that they've hosted. Uh, they've hosted in the past when the program was much larger, but they're considered probably our newer program. But all the other programs have been doing this for a number of years, have their own selection process that really aligns with how they approach their missions at their respective institutions. So one of the things I advise students to do is as they're thinking about ranking schools is to look at the mission um, and the programs that each of those institutions offer so that they can be mindful of you know, one, if they can see themselves um, in that place and at that school, but then also that the programs that they have to offer align with some of their interests and that they can tailor their application and how they rank to those interests. Um, I would strongly encourage you as you talk to students to rank all schools because, again, because each school has their own unique process. Um, you know, even if they may not get their first choice, in many cases, sometimes they may get their second and third choice because many of the schools look at all of the applicants um, and look at applicants in different ways. So it's to their advantage to rank all of the schools. When students are um, accepted, they will only be offered admissions to one JSI. Um, if they're not accepted, it's, it's one of two things. Either they're waitlisted um, and they will only be waitlisted at one JSI or they're not accepted. And typically, if they're not accepted, we will share a number of resources with them um, that they may be able to tap into. Um, and so try to foster and encourage them to still um, stay on that path of pursuing um, public service. Um, as I mentioned before, we receive on average about 600 applications for about 130 slots. Um, that number of spots that um, has grown over the last few years, we went from about 110 to being able to um, now offer 130 within the last two years, which is great for us, and are, are always looking for ways to be able to um, increase that number. Um, our applications open pretty quick here on September 1st, so early next week. Um, we encourage applicants to submit their uh, application early um, to become familiar with our application site, to walk through the different tabs, um, understand all the things they have to upload, um, to make sure they've, you know, done the edits and they submit the right things to us. I've met a number of students in the past year that just, you know, submit the wrong things in terms of uploading. So talking to your students about making sure that when they uh, make their edits and get their uh, feedback and they polish their documents, making sure that they submit the right ones to us is important as well. Um, and then we make our decisions in early February and we also uh, let students, alert students in early February if they have been admitted or not. So some of the benefits from our program is that all the schools in our um, graduate school consortium will um, apply fee waivers for uh, students that have gone through our program. So since these students cannot apply to as many policy schools without the burden of that financial piece in terms of application. Um, once they're accepted to any of the schools in our consortium and they have to be a policy school within the consortium, um, they are guaranteed at minimum um, a one-time award of $5,000 from um, the institution. Many of our um, graduate school consortium members do offer general uh, generous awards well above that $5,000. Um, they know that our students are um, 
competitive. They know that they're prepared and they are sought after. And so although that's the minimum because some of our schools just don't have the resources to give as generous packages, but may have exceptional programs, that's what we require. But again, oftentimes our students are seeing very generous packages because they are highly competitive. Um, we, over the last five years now, have been offering some short-term opportunities, and we also promote these to students that apply to our programs, both that are admitted and that are not admitted. And so some of your students may or may not have um, a participated in some of these, um, but our public service weekends um, are meant to really expose and introduce students to the range of opportunities um, available in the field of public service. And so these conferences really are three day kind of really quick exposure, um, help, helps them to build their networks, to get to meet faculty that are, are working in some areas that they may be interested in, and to really just get students excited about the field. Um, and has been a really, really, really great program for us and has grown over the years. We have a number of them listed for this fall. The application deadline for the first round of them, I believe, was September 12th, so there's still time. Um, and typically they're all over the country. And so some will have more of a regional feel and some will have a national feel. And you will see that in the um, description of each program. When you look on our website. So here's my information. So everything you can find, of course, on our website. Um, again, the application for the Junior Summer Institutes open on September 1st. Um, and they will close on November 1st. Um, and my email is the email that's listed there. So if you have questions, if you would like to be on our influencer list, so the list that we send out, um, if we have things coming up, such as the public service weekends, the application being open for the Junior Summer Institutes, feel free to shoot me an email to that email, ppia.office at ppiaprogram.org. And I will add you to our influencers list um, so that you start to see messages from us. Another way to hear from us is also to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and our newsletter will also have a lot of information about what's coming up, um, application deadlines, upcoming programs, a spotlight feature on some of our partners and alumni. So those are a couple of different ways to get engaged with us more deeply if you are interested. So with that, <clears throat> I'll wrap up and open up things for questions or turn it back over to Carmen to moderate that piece. Thanks, Simone. Now's a great chance for all of you to perhaps have your questions answered or think, anticipate what your students might want to know. And while you all are typing, I, since my mic works, I get the privilege of the first question. So when you talked a little bit about how students should highlight a call to public service in their application materials, Outside of some of the standard things like internships with the State Department or a city agency, are there good ways that students who maybe haven't had those opportunities can can showcase that call that they might have? Thanks, Carmen. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if they're doing things on campus, because um, we understand that sometimes uh, students have a number of other commitments and um, maybe aren't as active as they could be because of a number of responsibilities or uh, barriers, is that we are looking for students that have demonstrated in some way outside of the classroom. Um, so if, if they've done research on campus um, or work with a faculty member um, around some of the issues that they're interested in or just in general, um, that would be an, one way to talk about some of those demonstrated experiences if they are doing things on campus in terms of um, leadership, um, governance, um, student groups, um, around issues that they care about, that would also uh, be a number of, uh, another way to um, demonstrate how they've been engaged outside of the classroom if they're working. So jobs, you know, they just have a job and they're, and they're in a role that's calls upon them and their leadership in a unique way, um, whether it's interfacing community or not. Um, I would also say that's a way that they could talk about, you know, their commitment. Um, another piece that I'll lastly finish up here with is thinking about just their own story. And so if there has been a number of um, life experiences or situations 
that has um, really pushed them and motivated them to go down this path to bringing some light to that and being um, open and, and enough to share that with us. Um, that's also something that's that's, that's taken um, into consideration as well. And I know I'm talking to some great PPIA students, the way they've been able to articulate how different policy decisions maybe shaped those life experiences and why they want to go forward and, and change them or or mm -hmm. make them better serve folks with a story like theirs too. Yeah. Well, so we had a question about the summer program. How many credit hours does a student typically complete during that summer program? So for our program, they, they're not given credit. Um, they are given uh, an evaluation of, you know, how do they perform in those courses? Um, if we needed to put it in like a number of credits, we typically are steered away from that, but I would say roughly, we're, you know, we're looking at about six to seven credits if you wanted to put it like in credit hours that they are engaged in over the summer. So it's rigorous. I mean, mo for most cases, folks have class every day of the week, if not probably four days of the week, which with one day that they're doing um, either GRE prep or doing some sort of um, research um, whether it's um, independently or with on a project with other people. So in terms of the rigor, they're in class majority, large majority of the summer for seven weeks. And noting that, is there, are there elements that you look for in a student's profile to make sure that they're teed up for success? And, and how do you balance that with the need to reach kids who maybe need more intensive academic training in these areas, and then this knowing how a student is gonna succeed in this intensive program? Sure. So there's no uh, requirement of um, experiences like in stats or econ or even policy analysis. Um, how the curriculum is designed is that there is a lot of support embedded and so, you know, students aren't just taught and then left out and say, okay, now figure it out. There's a lot of team and group work. They all have um, a number of TAs or RAs that are working with them over the summer as well. They do a lot of uh, group study um, and that's encouraged. They work on modules and group. I mean, so the, the, the curriculum really models what they would experience in policy school, which is a lot of that work is not in independent, they're not doing it independently. They're working in teams and with groups with others. Um, and because they're looking at uh, students at a variety of levels, what has happened um, oftentimes is that then within that network, a cohort of students, they're helping each other and they're all at different levels. So we see a lot of, of that in terms of um, the academic support as well. Um, in terms of what we're looking for, you know, a few of the programs, at least one of them, Princeton offers two levels of stats. So they have like a um, one if students have had exposure to stats and then a level where if they have not. Um, some of the missions for some of our schools don't require um, stats. And so you can look at it from you know, that perspective, they're already used to interacting and working with students who may not have that exposure. And that's how they approach um, this program as well. Thanks, that's that's great help. Again, as folks have questions, please feel free to put them in that chat box or sadly you're gonna have to keep listening to me. Um, Tim, could you give us a preview a little bit about where the public service weekends will be held? I know a number of the folks on the line are in upstate New York and I think we've had some there in the past. So oh, yeah. will we be in a in a zip code near them anytime soon? Sure, I'm gonna pull them up real quick so that I tell the truth to you all. Um, we've been busy with these this year. So I think we are, after this fall, we would be up to 11 of them this year. Um, so the Milano School of Policy at the new school in New York City will be hosting one September 27th through the 28th. Um, University of California, so UCLA Luskin School in October, early October, October 4th through the 6th. Uh, University of Minnesota Humphrey School, October 11th through the 13th. Uh, University of California San Diego will host one October 11th through the 13th. Um, and then University at Albany, SUNY Rockefeller, which is upstate New York, 
Um, we'll offer one October 25th to the 27th. And then we will wrap up with, at Georgetown, um, the McCourt School um, of Public Policy and the Wall School of Foreign Service, November 22nd to the 24th. Um, the regional programs, they're mostly regional. So if you're in those areas and looking to recruit students from those areas, the only one that um, is a little bit more flexible is the Georgetown. They will give a little bit of a travel stipend to students if they want to try to travel off DC. Um, it isn't a large stipend, but just maybe enough to maybe either cover a train ride or a really, really cheap flight. Um, and they would be on their own for uh, finding somewhere to stay. So quite a few to choose from this fall. And the deadline for all of those is September 12th? So September 12th for the ones that are early fall. And then the ones that are late fall, the deadline is October 3rd. So Georgetown um, and I believe uh, SUNY Rockefeller will be that later date. Great. So there's still a little time for our folks to share this with their students. Yeah. So please do. Um, we would love for them to be, to be um, involved in that program. So while well, again, we wait for our colleagues, if you have any questions, Simone, could you talk a little bit about what happens after students complete, let's say the Junior Summer Institute and, and a little bit of the alumni services that maybe you all are able to do? Sure, once they complete um, the Institute, I feel like students, um, at least from my experiences with them, really have kind of more of a clear sense of the direction they wanna go into. Um, and because of the network, are starting to connect with other alum to find out what do they do post JSI. And so learning about other fellowship programs that they should be considering, um, internships, um, they're really starting to think about like what's next. And we, we do a little bit of support with that over the summer, but really the network um, is a place where students they can tap in um, to find out what are folks doing next and how are their experiences in those next steps as well. So we see a combination of that. And we also see students that are prepared to go right into uh, graduate school, you know, once they wrap up their undergrads, we see students applying directly. We also see students that are taking a number of years off to either do a fellowship program of another sort or um, work um, at an organization or work in DC. We see oftentimes see that um, to give a little bit of exposure to the field so they can decide exactly what they would like to do. Um, and the network is really good and it's probably one of the, I would say, the most exceptional parts of our program because we have folks um, on a global scale doing a variety of things. And so you could, the students can almost find someone who's very similar in interest um, and doing some things they may be interested in that they can connect with directly. Um, alongside that, that network, the large network, they spend seven weeks together on, on you know one of five of our hosts. And so they build their own just really night, tight knit network um, during this Junior Summer Institute, which is extremely powerful and probably one of the most, even most powerful for them because that is a group and a network they can tap back into to see what their peers are doing for support, motivation, um, a number of things. So that, you know, the relationships that form out of that summer are oftentimes relationships that last folks for quite some time, if not a lifetime. And so there's kind of a, there's tiers to the, the, these networks that happens as a result of being in our program that are extremely powerful for our, our fellows. Wonderful. Any other questions from our colleagues on the line? And I, I will say someone's always very good about replying via any of the media you see on your site. Yeah, so please um, you know, email me, um, join our newsletter, you know, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, let us know if you have any questions or if there's things you would like. Um, if we have an I've had an alum either from your institution that has participated, I have a toolkit I can give them to help you recruit on your campus. And as oftentimes we'll reach out to our alumni network to do some recruitment for us. Um, if there's students you want me to talk to directly to, we are available that way as well. If folks would like to request brochures for their offices, is there a good way for them to do that? Yeah, just shoot me shoot me an email and we can um, send you a couple things via email and in the mail. Wonderful. So mm -hmm. seeing no other folks typing, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today for this webinar. And particularly Simone, thank you for sharing all of this great information. And I look forward to seeing many more students 
represented uh, from the universities represented here at JSIs and PSWs and all of the rest of the alphabet soup that is PPIA. Thank you again very much, everyone. And thank you in particular, Simone, for all of your great work. Of course.